episode seven of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest cannabis hemp news stories of the week. I'm Steve Elliott, editor of ToqueSignals.com, and I bring you the news. First of all, let's look at our bud pick of the week. Saw some pretty flowers yesterday on my visit to Evergreen Health Center in Bremerton. Among them was this pre-98 Bubba Kush which is an indica dominant strain available for $12 a gram donation. The reason that pre-98 is important enough to specify is that some additional genetics were introduced into the strain after that year and it turns out that some connoisseurs preferred the strain before those genetics were introduced, thus pre-98 Bubba Kush. An interesting little story of marijuana genetics there. It makes a great nighttime pain relief insomnia relief medication. And speaking of great nighttime medications, I found a good medible yesterday also at Evergreen Health Center. This would be the Decadose Chiba Chews. A lot of you may have heard of Chiba Chews. They are establishing a reputation for themselves and they are found, they are found in a lot of the better dispensaries in multiple states including California, Colorado, and Washington. These particular Chiba Chews contain 175 milligrams of THC and that is a very respectable dose even for someone with an elevated tolerance like mine. The quad dose Chiba Chews for contrast sake contain 75 milligrams of THC. These decadose contain 175 and I can tell you I suffer from pretty serious chronic pain issues which interfere with my ability to rest at night and one of these addresses that very effectively. In fact, this morning I slept until 9.30 when normally pain wakes me up about 7 o'clock each morning. So if you can afford $25 per dose, relief is available to you. These have a big dose in them and if you don't have an elevated tolerance you can get two, three, maybe even four effective medicated sessions out of this. For someone like me it may take the whole thing. In any event, $25 and relief is yours. Let's look at the news. Our first three stories this week all relate in one way or another to the Drug Enforcement Administration, the infamous agency that's in charge of making sure that you don't get to smoke marijuana. Well, they do other things too, but that's why they mess with our lives, so let's concentrate on that aspect of their job. A group, in fact, a number of groups are calling on Congress to hold hearings on the DEA. They have established a sign-on letter which highlights numerous recent DEA scandals, including the secret use of National Security Agency and Central Intelligence Agency surveillance records, unfettered access to citizens' phone records, and many more scandals. More than 120 groups from across the political spectrum and around the globe, including the ACLU, Witness for Peace, the Drug Policy Alliance, and the International Drug Policy Consortium, a global network of 106 non-governmental organizations, sent a letter to Congress on Thursday. They called on key legislators from the House and Senate Judiciary and Oversight Committees to hold hearings on the DEA. For too long, Congress has given the DEA a free pass, said Bill Piper, Director of National Affairs at the Drug Policy Alliance. Our hope is that Congress does its job and provides oversight because this agency has a deeply troubling track record of unregulated and out of control behavior. The DEA must be reined in and held accountable, Piper said. The catalyst for this letter is a series of investigative articles from early August and September by Reuters and the New York Times. The articles outlined how the DEA has used certain CIA and NSA surveillance programs to pursue drug convictions in the United States. The revelations have added to the current controversy surrounding the NSA domestic surveillance programs. Defenders of the programs have up until now claimed that their sole use was to prevent terrorist attacks not perform domestic spying on nearly all Americans. Perhaps more worrisome is the fact that the letter notes that DEA agents are actively creating and encouraging other agencies to create fake investigative trails to disguise where the information originated. 
This is a scheme that prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, and others are arguing has robbed defendants of their right to a fair trial. On September 2nd, the New York Times published a story detailing how over several years, the DEA has had unlimited access to an AT&T database of all calls that pass through its phones and switches. Under this project called the Hemisphere Project, the U.S. government pays AT&T to place its employees inside the DEA so that the DEA can use these experts to gain access to decades of detailed records of private U.S. citizens' phone calls. Both stories expose what is merely the latest in a long line of controversial incidents involving the DEA. The letter calls on Congress to investigate the DEA and hold it accountable for its actions noting that although it's been 40 years since President Nixon established the DEA, Congress has rarely held hearings on the agency, its actions, and its efficacy. Moving to the next story, and it was alluded to in the first one, the DEA phone call surveillance database is bigger than the National Security Agency's phone call surveillance database. The DEA actually is spying on more people than the NSA. Now, did anybody ever really believe they would only spy on terrorists? The United States federal government has access to this massive database containing 25 years of AT&T phone call data. It's part of a secret program in which telephone company employees work beside federal and local law enforcement agents to track the phone calls of suspected drug dealers. These revelations completely confirm the biggest fears of civil libertarians and drug policy reformers in the United States, that the government uses large-scale surveillance programs for drug law enforcement rather than just for national security, which, of course, was the original excuse for the wholesale warrantless spying on American citizens. As first reported by Scott Shane and Colin Moynihan of the New York Times, the operation known as the Hemisphere Project has been ongoing for at least six years. It has access to every single phone call coming through any AT&T switchboard since 1987. This vast database grows by billions of calls every day. And as I said, it's even larger than the controversial database maintained by the National Security Administration, which only goes back for five years. This one goes back for 25. The federal government is currently paying AT&T to embed phone company employees with DEA agents and local police drug task forces as part of this hemisphere project, at least in the cities of Atlanta, Houston, and Los Angeles, and possibly elsewhere. These phone company employees sit alongside the DEA agents and local cops supplying them with the phone data. Now, government officials claim that the database is maintained by AT&T and that all law enforcement access to the records is controlled by valid subpoenas. They claim that the project does not involve listening to phone calls, but instead allows them to quickly connect the dots. Officials told NBC News that the database lets them establish call patterns by finding links between anonymous burner phones, the prepaid cell phones often used by drug dealers, and the networks of other phone numbers. Having the AT&T employees on hand to receive the subpoenas, government agents claim, makes for a quicker turnaround. Most of the subpoenas are administrative subpoenas, usually meaning they are issued by the DEA, how convenient for them, instead of by a grand jury or by a judge. We, like all other companies, must respond to valid subpoenas issued by law enforcement, said AT&T spokesman Mark Siegel. One slide in a PowerPoint presentation describing the Hemisphere program obtained by the New York Times says, all requesters are instructed to never refer to Hemisphere in any official document. The PowerPoint slides have the logo of the White House National Office of Drug Control Policy, the infamous ONDCP, on them. That's the federal agency headed by drug czar Gil Kurlikowski. They're marked law enforcement sensitive. And these slides list several instances in which the spy program helped find drug suspects or drug shipments, highlighting the usefulness of the Hemisphere program in tracking burner phones. Are other phone companies involved in addition to AT&T? 
Representatives refused to comment when asked whether they participated in Hemisphere or any similar U.S. government program to spy on American citizens. Moving on to the next story. This is looking back at a historical event that happened 25 years ago. On September the 6th, 1988, the DEA's own administrative law judge ruled that cannabis should be reclassified under federal law. The administrative ruling determined that marijuana has accepted medical uses, and for that reason, it ought to be reclassified under federal law. Drug Enforcement Administration Chief Administrative Law Judge Francis Young in the ruling determined, quote, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. By any measure of rational analysis, marijuana can be safely used within a supervised routine of medical care. Judge Young went on to say, it would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious for the DEA to stand between those sufferers and the benefits of this substance in light of the evidence in this record. The administrative law judge recommends that the administrator conclude that the marijuana plant considered as a whole has a currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States that there is no lack of accepted safety for use of it under medical supervision, and that it may lawfully be transferred from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 of the Federal Controlled Substances Act. This ruling was in response to an administrative petition filed by the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, NORML, back in 1972, which sought to reschedule cannabis federally. Tellingly, it took 16 years to get the actual ruling and then it was an unfavorable one. The federal government at first refused to even accept the petition until it was forced to do so by the U.S. Court of Appeals in 1974. Incredibly, they then refused to properly process it until again ordered to do so by the court in 1982. In 1986, after 14 years of foot dragging, the DEA finally held public hearings on the issue before Judge Young, who rendered his decision two years later. But John Lawn, then administrator of the DEA, simply rejected Judge Young's determination. And in 1994, the Court of Appeals allowed Lawn's reversal to stand, maintaining the Schedule I classification of cannabis as a prohibited substance with no accepted medical use and a lack of accepted safety under medical supervision. The DEA in July 2011 rejected a separate marijuana rescheduling petition initially filed in 2002. And this past January, a three-judge panel for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia affirmed the DEA's decision ruling that there aren't enough clinical studies to call for a judicial review of federal marijuana prohibition. Of course, as we've learned from Ron Marczyk with his Worth Repeating series on talk signals, marijuana is one of the best studied medicines in history. So this is a patent smokescreen, if you'll excuse the pun. Petitioners have appealed that decision to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it may or may not elect to review the matter. The Supremes haven't been particularly marijuana friendly in past decisions, so don't hold your breath. Moving on, U.S. Senator John McCain said this week that maybe we should legalize marijuana. Coming from a man who previously had said that there is no such thing as medical marijuana, and has been resolutely against its legalization, this represents a major policy change. Senator McCain was at a town hall which was dealing mainly with the Syria situation when the subject of marijuana came up. And according to reporter Tim Steller with the Arizona Daily Star, who tweeted McCain's words, what the senator said was, maybe we should legalize. We're certainly moving that way as far as marijuana is concerned. I respect the will of the people. Now, of course, John McCain's daughter, Megan McCain, already came out in favor of cannabis legalization and admitted she had smoked a joint back in June 2012. Continuing on the news, in Mexico, the Mexico City City Council is considering marijuana legalization and establishing cannabis smoking clubs. 
the capital city hosted a three-day forum on drug policy as Latin America is struggling against illicit trafficking. The proposals being considered by Mexico City include allowing adults to grow up to three cannabis plants each, as well as a system of nonprofit private clubs, according to Estela Damian, who is a councilwoman with Mexico City's ruling Democratic Revolution Party, the PRD. We will be very responsible in this debate, said Manuel Granados, chair of the City Council Governance Committee. In Mexico City, we agree on replacing criminal policies with health policies. We are ready to hold this debate and at the right time to legislate. The City Council could debate this legalization proposal in October. Former Mexican President Vicente Fox, who was in office from 2000 to 2006, has endorsed the legalization of marijuana as a solution to drug cartel violence. This prohibition is the last frontier of prohibitions, Fox said. The issue of abortion, the issue of gays, the issue of alcohol, these arbitrarily imposed prohibitions have ended, and they have ended because they don't work. Current Mexican President Enrique Pina Nieto, however, has taken a stand against legalization. He, in fact, hopes to apply stricter sentencing for cannabis traffickers and producers. Mexico City has almost 9 million people, plus 11 million more in its suburbs. It's considered something of a liberal oasis in Mexico. It has stood out from the rest of the country in recent years by allowing abortion and legalizing gay marriage. Mexico already allows the possession of up to five grams of marijuana for personal consumption, but growing it and selling it are still illegal. One of the councilmen drafting the bill said he likes the new legalization law in Washington state, which allows adults 21 and older to possess and use up to an ounce of marijuana. He also praised the progress of drug policy reform in Uruguay, which could soon become the first nation in the world to produce and distribute cannabis legally. Speaking of Washington State, our Liquor Control Board this week announced the proposed rules for legal recreational cannabis in Washington. They announced that 334 marijuana stores will be allowed to open in Washington. Each county in the state will have its own cap on the number of stores. For instance, the most populous county where Seattle is located is King County. It will be allowed 61 stores, with 21 of those being located in Seattle city limits. Pierce County can have up to 31 marijuana stores. Snohomish will be capped at 35, with five of those in Everett. Thurston County will have 11, with two each in Olympia and Lacey. Whatcom County will have 15, with six stores in Bellingham. Kitsap County will be allowed 10 marijuana stores and Clallam County will have six. Mason County will have five stores and Jefferson County will get four. The entire state can produce at most 40 metric tons or two million square feet of marijuana per year, according to the Washington State Liquor Control Board and its revised proposed rules. That amount is supposedly based on state research about the amount of cannabis consumed in Washington State prior to legalization. Now, that research on state marijuana consumption is rather controversial. It included an average marijuana use of two grams. It erroneously copied data from a United Nations report, and it introduced a 15% across the board calculation error. The rules also include three production tiers for marijuana producers, less than 2,000 square feet, from 2,000 to 10,000, and from 10,000 to 30,000 square feet. The maximum amount of cannabis allowed on the premises of an indoor grow is 125% of an annual harvest, according to the WSLCB. Indoor grows can have half of an annual harvest on hand, and retailers can have a four-month average supply as inventory. Now, unfortunately, no personal grows or home grows are allowed under I-502. Only commercial business grows, for which one must get a license, are allowed. Anything over 40 grams can still be prosecuted as a felony if you're in possession of it. I-502 only legalized up to an ounce of pot. The proposed rules would require a thousand foot buffer between stores and schools 
not as the crow flies, but in common paths of travel. Ads and labels using cartoon characters or other designs that may appeal to children are banned. The board decided that no single entity could have more than three licenses in each of the producer, processor, and retail categories. And the rules were updated, not only in response to citizen feedback, but also to meet the eight federal government enforcement priorities announced last week by Attorney General Holder. Washington State's first marijuana retail outlets will probably open in early June 2014, according to WSLCB Chairperson Sharon Foster. Retailers will be allowed to stay open as late as midnight. No internet sales will be allowed. Some cities are already passing moratoriums on these legal pot stores. This may result in access issues that could, up, could end up in court, according to the board. Hearings are planned for October the 9th. The board will adopt the rules on October 13th if things go according to schedule. And license applications for the three types of marijuana licenses, producer, processor, and retailer, must be filed by December 18th. You can't get a license if you owe any back taxes to Washington State. Continuing in Washington State and on the I-502 tip with our next story, Medical marijuana advocates are justifiably scared by the I-502 rules, according to activist Steve Sarich of the Cannabis Action Coalition. Now, the federal government, through Attorney General Eric Holder, has announced that it won't sue to challenge the marijuana legalization laws approved by the voters in Washington and in Colorado. It's ironic, though, that many medical cannabis patients in Washington state say they still have plenty to fear. This time, what they fear is the rules for recreational marijuana legalization as I-502 is implemented in the state. The patients are scared by threats that the state and possibly federal agents as well will go after medical marijuana growing and selling which falls outside the recreational system created by 502, according to Surik. Now, could safe access medical strains be going away? It's possible. State licensed recreational marijuana producers and retailers won't have much initiative to grow or sell specialty medical strains, many of which by definition have a very limited customer base. Surich, who campaigned against I-502, thinks the new law will result in more patients being charged with DUI under the new strict standards, five nanograms per milliliter of active THC in the blood which unfortunately science has shown isn't correlated to impairment among experienced users. But those limits are imposed under 502. Surich believes the entire medical marijuana community is under siege. I don't know how else to describe it, he said. We're under siege. We know they are coming after us. But why they think we're a risk to them, I don't know. The Liquor Control Board, the legislature, and apparently the feds. Part of Steve Search's concern stems from statements made just last week by local representatives of the Federal Department of Justice and by Washington Governor Jay Inslee when the feds said they wouldn't sue to stop the state's new legal pot system under I-502, but that they would pursue all marijuana activity outside of that system. The continued operation and proliferation of unregulated for-profit entities outside of the state's regulatory and licensing scheme is not tenable and violates both state and federal law, reads a statement from U.S. Attorney Jenny Durkin in Seattle and U.S. Attorney Michael Ormsby in Spokane. While our resources are limited, we will continue to enforce federal law in this area, the statement read. Now, Steve Sarich is worried that Washington will also shut down the medical system and try to stop patients from growing their own. Patients are currently allowed to grow up to 15 plants and 24 ounces of usable marijuana in Washington can be in their possession. If they are forced to bring the medical community into compliance with the recreational rules, those 15 plants will go away because they don't have licenses to grow recreational marijuana. Those 24 ounces will go away because under 502 you can only have one ounce. If they stop the patients from growing, Surich said, they're going to grow anyway. 
and you're going to see sick people going to jail and losing their kids. It's crazy and it's cruel. What I'm going to do is give up anything that has to do with a business in marijuana, sir, it said. I believe that what Jenny Durkin says is what she's going to do and that they're going to go after medical. Jay Inslee has essentially said the same thing. They're going to go after medical and the legislature has tried to turn us over to the Liquor Control Board. I would have rather they turned us over to Fish and Wildlife, Steve Sir said. He said he's not going to focus on patient ag advocacy. I'm tired of being raided, so I'm going to take a lower key position, he said. Going completely around the world to Australia for our last story, the Australian Hemp Party has called for cannabis to be legalized. Hemp in this case stands for Help in Marijuana Prohibition. They've launched their election campaign on Monday calling for cannabis to be legalized for personal and medical use as it already is for industrial purposes in Australia. Members of the Hemp Party inflated a 33-foot plastic replica of a joint outside the State Police Commissioner's office in Sydney. Activists said Australia's jails were overflowing with people criminalized for no good reason. America has given us huge encouragement, said Hemp President Michael Balderstone. Half of America now has access to medical cannabis, and now they started to get new regulations for recreational cannabis. So you know the wall is down there and no big deal, the place hasn't gone crazy. Cancer patient Jen Lee handed out hemp party leaflets to amused office workers enjoying the lunchtime sunshine in a city park. The leaflets called for parliament to end what Lee called discrimination against cannabis users. Lee's a mother of three who has breast cancer, and she said she would not be alive if not for cannabis oil. She said she only wants to be able to buy it without breaking the law. I'm disgusted at my country, but I'm proud that I've finally taken some initiative and I'm fighting for my rights to medicate, Lee said. I want to live. I don't want to be put off in some respite center to die. I'm 35. I have children. I want to be there. The Hemp Party is fielding a dozen candidates from six states in the Australian federal election on September the 7th, including herbalist B.J. Futter from New South Wales, who said marijuana legalization is inevitable. I understand that we are not going to get elected this time around, Futter said. My hope is that we shake the foundations of those that are in power. This plant will be legalized. It's just a matter of time. Industrial hemp is already legal to grow with a license in Australia, but the hemp party wants to extend that to marijuana consumers by regulating cannabis sales and removing pot's criminality. The party also wants to establish a commercial hemp industry in Australia, producing fuel, oil, and other environmentally friendly products. Let's take a look now at the stories not to miss as you are going through the information on Talk Signals this week. You certainly want to take a look at the story, Wild Hemp Grows Everywhere in Nebraska. This story consists of a collection of photos collected by Diana Sunshine Wolf. She's a Nebraska resident and she made it her project a few years ago to start taking photographs of the wild hemp plants that she saw growing in Nebraska. You will see from these many, many photographs a lot of beautiful plants growing in Nebraska. And when you look at these, you can think about the fact that these plants represent a promising genetic stock for future hemp crops in the United States. They actually began as cultivated hemp back before marijuana was declared illegal in 1937 under the Marijuana Tax Act. So these are the plants that have continued to grow in the fields and roadsides since that time. They don't really care that they're against the law, so they're still out there. These plants, of course, contain almost no THC and won't get you high even if you smoke or eat them. They do, however, contain lots of medicinal CBD, a potent anti-inflammatory and anti-pain agent that is another of the cannabinoids found in marijuana. So they do have medical value in addition to their industrial value from the fiber in their stalks and the essential fatty acids found in the seeds, which can be uh, consumed in the form of hemp oil, hemp seed oil. The second story not to miss this week on Toke Signals is by Ben Reagan of the CPC, a dispensary in Seattle. 
what Ben tells us about is medical cannabis is great for sports injuries and active lifestyles. This story goes into the fact that if you use cannabis rather than conventional painkillers, you're not just masking the pain. You are actually working to address that inflammation and to heal the source of the pain. So you definitely want to look into that article if this type of sports injury is something that you have to deal with. Thirdly and lastly, on the stories not to miss, you want to check out Ron Marks' It's Worth Repeating from this week. It's called Marijuana Treats Anxiety and Depression. And of course, those of you who follow Ron know that he is a registered nurse, he's a former NYPD cop, and he's a former high school health teacher. So that confluence of careers and life experiences has put him in a very good position to teach you about the benefits of medicinal cannabis. The fact that many of the psychiatric drugs currently used, which we get from Big Pharma, are either ineffective or downright dangerous, means that cannabinoid-based medicines are the future when it comes to psychiatric medications. The cannabinoid homeostatic healing perspective advanced by Ron Marksick in this article is a paradigm changer. It's a game changer. And it won't be very much longer that people who need psychiatric drugs will be forced to take pharmaceutical poisons. Very soon now, natural, herbal, organic marijuana can replace many of those pharmaceuticals if we allow the concerns for human health and wellness to trump the concerns for big pharma's corporate profits. Don't forget to send in your bud picks of the week. If you'd like to make your bud famous, we can get those up there for you. We always like to see the pretty flowers. That brings us to the end of this week's show. Hope you choose to join us again next week for episode eight. Until then, keep telling the truth about marijuana and we will see you next time. Stay lifted.